Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen from Databricks. Uh, today we have Graham Heinbach. Um, I'm a business development uh, part of Partner Engineering, and I have the pleasure of introducing Mark Geisler, uh, ex IBM mainframe extraordinaire, knows all the details. And I've hey, Mark, thanks for joining me today. Great to be working with you, Graham. Cool. Thank you, Mark. Mark's going to add color commentary. So the, the goal today is to walk you through. Uh, using Attunity on the mainframe, uh, specifically DB2 ZOS, and then uh, Mark will add some other com color commentary um, on the other technologies we support on the mainframe. And of course, load that data, do uh, full load and change data capture uh, from the source mainframe to Azure Databricks. So we're going to walk you through that. Um, we've got our Databricks uh, environment already set up. If I uh, click on the, the data element over here, we can see I've got a um, a database called mainframe and there are no tables in it. Over to Attunity Replicate, um, I have a task uh, partially built. So I'm gonna double click on this task uh, to go into task configuration. Um, as you can see, I've got a source and target already defined. So let's, let's take a look at this source definition, shall we? Just a simple double click on it. Um, so I've got my, uh, my server name, which is a, a, an IP address or gets resolved to an IP address, uh, a port, a, a location mark, it says Dallas B. What does that mean on the mainframe? So in, in, in DB2 terms, what a location is, is, is basically, it, it defines kind of a, a database at the DB2 level. Um, it's actually logical, it's nothing physical, but when we connect into uh, the mainframe via the distributed data facility interface, it requires us to say what, what database, what location are we, are we connecting to. So it's basically a DB2 subsystem that we're connecting to, and that's the alias name for it. So I could set up multiple uh, source endpoints, if you will, to different uh, subsystems on the mainframe. For, for different DB2 subsystems. Now, for, for Replicate, we have a very lightweight install on the mainframe. Okay. Uh, we put it, what we call Replicate for Z on, on the mainframe, and, and basically it allows us, uh, allows the Replicate source capture to interact with the mainframe system read data for full load, and then uh, for changes, we actually run the uh, IFI interface, the IFKID 306 API that IBM supports that allows us to read log records for the tables that we care about. Cool, awesome, Very awesome. straightforward, lightweight. Excellent, and then under advanced, I noticed I can uh, say how often I want to check for CDC records, and then also this, this UDTF name. What's, what's right. that specifically pointing to on the so mainframe? The way that we uh, actually, it's, it's actually a really cool uh, interface in that the way that we access the IFI, we're actually doing it through what we call a user defined table function. So it looks like a table from Replicate's perspective, and we're just selecting against it, but it calls out to an external module that uh, runs those IFI uh, calls because they have to e execute on the mainframe. We can't run IFI from Replicate. It actually has to run on the uh, on the mainframe to access those log records. So that's what the UDTF, it's kind of our way of interfacing to the IFI. And then within that code, we actually pull up the, 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 the log records that meet the tables, that, that match the tables that we're replicating, uh, and then into a result set, and then that, you know, we can define the, the, the size of the result set, the max size of the result set that we're gonna bring, you know, down from, uh, from the mainframe. Cool, awesome, awesome, that's, that's, that's excellent. I'm going to go to general, um, and then of course I've got a user ID and password and the, and the driver we're using, so I can say uh, test connection. Um, this mainframe is behind the uh, Tunity firewall, so I'm also VPN, uh, virtual private network, into our network, so that's how I can get access to it. So it said it's, it's successful, that's, that's good news. And then of course I've got my uh, Azure Databricks uh, pointing to that mainframe database endpoint. Um, I've got my description, of course, I've got my Azure storage, uh, my access key, and then my uh, container name that I'm going to write to, and then, of course, a, a target folder. We're going to call it mainframe. And then I've got my, uh, my Databricks connectivity uh, thread, so we are our HTTP path, um, the database name that we're going to write to as well on the man point. So we'll write the metadata um, up into to Azure Databricks, and then we're going to use um, Azure storage underneath it to actually store that data and then use a mount point with inside of Databricks to mount that storage so we can uh, we can do table interaction. So I'm gonna show you uh, all that during the demo. So also test connection, make sure that we're able to get to our, uh, our Azure Databricks environment. Um, it is up and running. Excellent news, that's all working. Perfect. So as part of building a task in Replicate, uh, pretty simple, I'm gonna say table selection. Um, it's gonna to connect to the mainframe using that uh, endpoint connection that we just defined in the mainframe. Um, I have a whole bunch of schemas up here. I kindly using Mark's user ID and password today. 
Um, so uh, Mark's uh, got a couple of tables that we set up. So H I J K L M. It was hiding from you. <laughs> it was. I'm my, I need a new pair of glasses as I, yeah. as I move into the 21st century. So we've got a tables here. So we're going to pick countries. And I'm just going to use my shift key, uh, scroll down a little bit more, and uh, basically pick pick these tables here. So we've got countries, we've got departments, we've got employees, we've got regions, uh, we've got jobs, locations. Um, so we've got a, a good selection of tables. So I'm going to say, yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's pick those. I'm going to double click on the employees table. Uh, we full support as Mark knows for disparate schema. So what I want to do here on the employees table is create a, a new column. So I'm going to click on transformation and uh, say, let's create a, a new column, call it new call. And click on our expression uh, here to pop into the expression builder icon. Um, so I'm going to take first name, just simply double click on it. Um, and then under my functions, um, I can turn around. I've got some string functions. I've got some operators. Let's uh, do an operator. Let's concatenate uh, first name, put a, a space in here, um, and then concatenate it with, um, let's see what other functions we want to pick. Um, maybe we have a function to, to um, do some data enrichment. So I've got a source lookup um, to my source mainframe. I might want to say, hey, I've got my object ID, but I want to bring over the object description as well if I'm creating a table in third normal form, um, but I don't want to replicate the complete 100 billion object description table. So we could do that or even do a target lookup. Um, so look up that data. Maybe we've got some, some additional data that we want to augment uh, from our target. Um, support for user-defined functions. I might want to add something like HPE voltage um, for, for PCI compliance or 256-bit triple DES encryption. Uh, we give you a set of C++ libraries and headers so you can uh, build expressions and, and add them into Expression Builder. So data enrichment functions I talked about, date, time, expressions, numeric, uh, strings, all those, those different functions. Uh, but back to my columns, maybe I want to pull some header information, maybe I want the timestamp of the transaction or the operation. Uh, but today we're going to kind of concatenate first name, um, a space, and then last name. So just double click on it and uh, it pops into Expression Builder. Um, so I can test the expression here in Expression Builder. Let's say Bob Smith, test my expression, and we know it's successful. So some of the other things I could do is if, uh, if I had a parallel load, if I had partitioned tables, um, I could turn around and, and set up multiple threads to read by partition, part, by partition um, or set up for filtering as well if I need some uh, subset uh, data to load this transformation. Yes, and it notices that it's changed. So uh, that's, uh, that's perfectly good. Okay, so I've got my table selection. Some of the other components are global transformations. Um, so here I'm going to take uh, the specific table names, which are all in uppercase, and convert them to lowercase. So we want to do that. Um, so I'm going to save save this uh, task. Any other commentary, Mark, that you'd like to add with the mainframe? Yeah, Graham. Uh, actually, hit, hit task settings there. I wanted to show you one thing in particular as it relates to the mainframe. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Yep. So whenever you have DB2 as the source, notice that one of the options down there is character substitution. Oftentimes in DB2 you get these funny characters right in the middle of a column, and uh, because DB2 allows that, you can put binary data in the middle of columns. So sometimes that creates translation issues when we're translating from EBCDIC or Unicode from the mainframe going into an ASCII or Unicode you know, database. And uh, so uh, we have the a way here of, of adding, kind of looking for that character, that, that binary character, and substituting what we want it to be in the, in the target so that, so that the uh, tr character translation uh, you know, executes properly. So that's just a nice little feature that we add. So in, anytime DB2Z is, is a source, that, that option will actually pop up in, in your task settings. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. I did not know that. Learn something new every day. That's pretty cool. All right, so we have our task ready to go. We have our table set. Um, under my task settings for, for Databricks, we are going to run our full load task. I'm going to run uh, five in parallel. Um, under change processing, we've applied changes off, but we've store changes on. So we're going to build a, a base table and then what we call a change table um, when we do our, our change data capture um, um, part of this, uh, this demonstration. All right, I'm going to run it. I'm ready to run. So here we've got resume processing. I've done this demo a couple of times. Target reload would rebuild the metadata for me. And if I look under the advanced run options, um, I might have had a task. I might have uh, stopped it for a reason to change it, to augment it. 
Um, I want, may want to start a specific date and time or specific uh, system control number or logical sequence number, as I said, rebuild the metadata or use a recovery checkpoint. So all of these, uh, these features are available to the product. So I'm going to say cancel and I'm going to say let's rebuild it. So when I hit reload target, it's going to jump from designer mode over to monitor mode. We'll be able to see um, the, uh, the process of the task. And as uh, Mark has pointed out, it's going to you know, connect over VPN, connect up to the mainframe, pull all the metadata about the tables we're interested in, send that metadata over to Databricks, uh, to, the, to the metadata repository, build the table schemas for us, and then start the initial load process. So it will take a, a second or two to, uh, to start this task. Right, Mark? And actually, one of the things that it does is, is it first actually uh, uses that IFI to find a, a point of consistency, a transactional point of consistency in the log. Mm -hmm. So it'll see if there's any open transactions. If there is, it waits till those transactions have committed, and then it picks that LSN that is the point of consistency, and then we start full loading from that point, and it'll start capturing any changes to the tables that we're loading while they're being loaded, and then cache those and then apply them after the load finishes. So it's, I mean, Replicate's doing some a lot of work under the covers here that you don't have to you know deal with or, or worry about uh, because Replicate's taking care of it for you. So as our task is running, I'm going to connect to uh, Azure Databricks. Um, here's a simple uh, JDBC tool set called uh, DB Visualizer. Um, so when I connect up to my Databricks instance, um, it'll pull down all the information about the, uh, the metadata and the tables that are available inside of, uh, inside of Databricks. So I've got my, uh, my database called Mainframe. Um, so I'm going to click in here, and as you can see, we have our, our, our table definitions. So it's building those table definitions uh, as we speak, which is pretty exciting. Um, I can also, view, if I come over to uh, to data under my uh, my Microsoft Azure um, portal, and then here's our, our mainframe data. So, to replicate, and we can see, yep, our seven tables are finished. So let's take a look at employees. So if I take a look at my uh, my employees table, um, here I've got my my info, my column uh, information uh, about this table. So we're pulling the, the metadata from Databricks. And as you can see, we've converted everything to, to the table name to lowercase, but we've left the column names in uppercase. And I can uh, click on data. So with inside this data, we're returning all the data from Databricks. And as you can see, we have a basically a list of uh, Stephen King as our first name, and his phone number, and his salary um, for all those specific uh, employees. But there's new call. So we added a new column uh, which concatenated first name and last name. So that, that data is, is available. And if I uh, go over to employees uh, and I look at employees CT, the change table, it's currently a view as I can pop over here to uh, GH employees. Um, we get the column information and the, the Azure portal pulls down that data as well. So again, we have our, our Stephen King. So taking a look at this salary information, what I'm going to do is change it. So I see change data capture program and uh, we can increase and decrease employee salaries by a dollar. So uh, I'm gonna, before I, uh, let's pop over here again to, uh, to change processing. And as you can see, here's a list of our tables and no change data capture, no transactions have happened uh, on the source system since our So let me uh, do, so it's connected up to the mainframe. Um, and as you can see, it takes a, a second or two before we, uh, we read that information. There we've picked up the 107 uh, employees. Yeah, that's that five-second interval. If you remember, we're we we're kind of pulsing. So correct. Yeah. If we don't have, if we don't, if we're at the end of log, then we wait five seconds before we go back. If we're not, we'll keep going. You know, until we pull all the records off from the end of the log. So we can click on the uh, the mainframe folder, and inside the mainframe folder, we can see that we have our our GH employees. If I if I double click on the employees, there's our CSV file. Um, and then again, if I take a look at the uh, employee CT, the change table, we have our, our change table file to a DB Visualizer. And I take a look at my, uh, we looked at our employees table. We can take a look at the data from the employees table. And then we can see, so the salary is 24003. And then if I look at the change table, uh, we'll have the before image and the after image um, of those transactions that happened on the source. So there we go. So here's our before image. If I scroll over, we can see it's for Stephen King, um, and his salary before was was twenty four zero zero three, and unfortunately it was uh, reduced by a dollar by twenty four zero zero two. And the reason why we do a base table and a change table is then compose for for Delta Lake. We'll pick up those base table and the change table um, transactions, leveraging the Spark SQL merge command, 
and then create a, a final table for us, which mimics the source OLTP system. Um, also, I can pop over here again to our, our Microsoft Azure portal, take a look at the employees and the employee CT. It gives us a description of the change table so we know what the columns are. And once again, we can look at that data. So that's the demo, Mark. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you, you liked it. And um, let me know if there's uh, any other components that we want to look at. Uh, the only other thing that I'll, I'll mention is uh, along with, uh, from the mainframe perspective, along with being able to grab changes with DB2, we also support grabbing uh, changes within an IMS DB database as well as vSAM with Replicate. So uh, we install a little different component up there, uh, you know, uh, than, than just the uh, Replicate for to get to IMS, you know, through the hierarchical storage uh, and, and through DVDs. But, uh, uh, and vSAM, you know, through COBOL copybooks, but uh, we support you know those three primary uh, mainframe databases, which pretty much covers you know ninety percent of the the mainframe data out there. Cool. Well, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, next, we're going to go over to Mark, and Mark's going to give us a detailed description um, of how the components that need to be installed in the mainframe, but how it all interacts. How did we uh, we build this uh, this wonderful demo and connect to the mainframe today? All right, so um, the way, uh, just to kind of drill down, a, a, you know, maybe a 10,000 feet, a little bit closer to what's going on in the mainframe, um, you know, as it relates to getting access to DB2Z data, um, here's, you know, here's the replicate server that, uh, that Graham was showing through the replicate UI. Uh, we do use, a, you know, the DB2 data server uh, driver in order to access DB2. That's the only additional software that you need to install on, on the replicate server machine. Uh, and then when we issue the calls out, uh, during the full load, again, it comes through that distributed data facility uh, interface, we're actually accessing the data directly uh, and bringing that back and then, you know, pushing that, in this case, into Databricks through the, you know, the target driver. Um, but uh, when it comes to the, the CDC component, uh, you know, grabbing those, you know, live changes, that's where we're executing that UDTF, that user-defined table function. Um, and it's going over in, uh, in, in doing an external c uh, call to a load module that's running that IFKID 306 uh, API that's accessing the log records real time. In our call here, we're actually sending, a, in essence, a where clause with all the object IDs. So we only filter back the, the table, the, the log records that, that are uh, for the tables that we're replicating. Uh, and then we kind of queue that in some memory. Uh, that's where we're you know, storing up that result set. And then once we... Uh, uh, have uh, enough data, uh, and, and or we've hit the end of end of um, uh, log, then we'll we'll actually push that result set back down to replicate server. That's where any transformation work would happen, any filtering work, uh, any uh, character set translation, you know, all of those things that that Graham showed you in the replicate UI designer uh, would happen, and then you know, of course, then push that data into into Databricks. So. Uh, so yeah, that, I think that's the uh, you know that gives you kind of a, a little different. You know, at least you got a, a visual on you know, on what's going on in the mainframe uh, as we're accessing DB2 data. Cool. Well, thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks everyone to listening to our podcast today. Really appreciate it. Um, any questions? Feel uh, free to reach out to the partner enablement team. Um, and if there's any uh, joint opportunities, please feel re feel free to reach out to your uh, local uh, opportunity slash click account exec. And that's it from us. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. It was a great morning. Thank Always you. a pleasure, Graham. Always a pleasure working with you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.